Rafa House Ministries, and uh, I titled my message tonight, Overcoming Rejection and Abuse. And this is my testimony, but it's the Lord's testimony. Um, I'd just like to give, take a moment to pray and just ask God to bless us tonight. Lord, you know this is more about you than it ever was about me. And the reason we go back this far and tell these, these things is because there are people out there who are hurting. There are people out there who need to know how wonderful you are and how strong and powerful to lift us up and change our lives and get us back on track. And when all the pieces are broken and shattered, that you put us back together and you make something out of our lives that we couldn't even believe if you had told us in advance what you could do. So I just give you all the glory. And I believe that there are people tonight that will be listening, that will be helped by what I have to say. So I'm going to start with the very beginning. Um, I lived in northern New Jersey when I was born. I was up in Bergen County. and. Um, the rejection of, for, of me started before I was born, apparently. I didn't know that until much later, but my mother would always tell the story how she would not even look at me for the first three days after I was born. She kept on screaming, take her away, I don't want to see her. I mean, I know that story because she would tell it to everybody. And the reason for that apparently was because she wanted to have a boy and not a girl. It's amazing how... Um, all around the world, there's discrimination against girls. It's not just in other countries, but it even happens here. And so the, the nurses would come in after many days and say, well, can you give her a name at least? You know, and she, she couldn't do that. Somebody else had to come and, and name me. Uh, actually, um, a person who was not even re related to me gave my name. So that was my, my beginning. But while I was still even an infant, Apparently, this, this was going on, this, this terrible abuse was already starting. Um, how do I know that? Because she would tell the story. She told the story about how I was in a high chair, and I, she would slap me to get me to eat the food that I would not apparently eat, and um, I wouldn't eat it. So for three days, she kept serving the same food, and for three days, I wouldn't eat the food. And finally, she was like slapping me in the face, and when I started to cry, she would jam it down my throat. Um, at which point my grandfather was visiting. He came around the corner and didn't, you know, she didn't see him. And he was a man of God. And he said, why are you hitting the baby? And she said, because for three days she won't eat anything. She'll die if she doesn't eat something. And he said, could you just leave me with the baby for a few minutes and just go in the other room? And she said she did, but she looked around the corner and watch what was going on. She said she saw him making the sign of the cross on my forehead and praying something. And then she came back in the room and he said, feed the baby now, she's going to eat. And I ate like I was starving. So I was up against this all the, all the time as a very young child. Just I, I mean, I just have horrible memories of being beaten for, you know, sometimes hours by my mother, not my father. This was my mother. And it was often done, or usually done, when my father wasn't there. And that's what life was like. And I didn't understand it. When I was much, much older, after I had three children of my own, one day I had the courage to confront my mother. And I said, Mom, could you please tell me why you treated me the way you did? You just beat me unmercifully all the time. And she said, nobody believes me, but you were born hating me, she said. She said, I knew by the time you were nine months old that you hated me. And, and see, the, the thing is, the devil is such a liar. <laughs> I mean, everybody knows nine-month-old babies don't hate people. But she said, I knew that you didn't love me. You loved your father. So then there, there was this jealousy, too. So if my father spent any time with me or helped make a toy or put it together, she would rip it to shreds in a rage the next day. This is this was what my life was like. So at any rate, they... Uh, put me in Catholic school and um, maybe not because they were religious but I, I think it was convenient because you just had to walk just a little bit from my house to the school and you're there 
So I remember one incident, I was in kindergarten and um, I couldn't find my shoes. So my mother, I think she probably threw me against the wall and beat me for like 45 minutes. Well, of course that made me late for school. So when I got to school, the nuns who were also that same kind of harshness to them, you know, why are you late? So I said, because I couldn't find my, my shoes. So they said, go to the office right now. So I went to the office and Mother Superior said, well, we're gonna have to put you on the spanking machine. So I was young and I believed this stuff, you know. I was terrified of the nuns. I was terrified of my mother. I, I thought life was like that, you know. <laughs> Whether you're here or there, it's always the harsh. There wasn't anything else. And so I was screaming, no, please don't do it, don't do it, you know. And they were pointing to something in the corner that had a big uh, sheet over it. They said, that's it, that's the spanking machine. Said, no, please. Another nun said, if you're found talking, I'm going to cut your tongue out. And when I walked by her wastebasket, I saw, I could swear I saw a tongue. I was so afraid, you know. So I was living in fear all the time. I remember as a child, if my mother was just even walking by, I would, my heart would start beating really fast. I was so afraid of her. I was really afraid of her. If she came near me, I would like duck. Now this is not, I'm not saying these things to make my mother look bad. And at the end of her life, my mother got saved. And, I, and of course, I forgive her and, and everybody involved in these things. I'm just telling you because this is what my life was like. And, and what's her story? You know what? I don't even know all her story. She got married at 17. Her father was an alcoholic who abandoned the family at, when she was very young, beat the kids unmercifully. So, you know, these things have a way of just perpetuating. And, and the cycle goes on and on, unless the Holy Spirit comes in and breaks that cycle. You're in this mess. So anyway, uh, for 13 years, kindergarten to 12th grade, I went to Catholic school. Now, what was the good part of that? Well, the good part was they taught about Jesus. And I believed that Jesus was the Son of God. They told us that. We had religion as a subject every day. We also had catechism we had to memorize, and if you didn't know it, you know, <laughs> They'd come down with a ruler and slam your wrist, and you know, it was rough. But I believed it, and I had a faith in God. But they would take you so far, and they didn't take you the next step. I believed Jesus died for my sins. I believed he was raised from the dead. But they never told you about accepting him as your savior. In fact, we were not allowed to read the Bible. They said, we'll read the Bible for you and tell you what it says. I never saw a Bible. And so that was the situation when I left for college. Believing in God, but not really born again, not really having an experience with him. You know, you can know about something and it's not knowing something. I mean, I, I just remember for three years in high school and four years in college, I studied French. I knew everything about the country. I knew the culture. I knew the places. I knew the food. But nothing was like when that plane landed down. <laughs> And when I was 21, I went to France for the first time, and it was so amazing. It, yes, it was all that I heard about, but it was different because I was there, and I was experiencing it. It would be like if a person had never gone to the beach because they lived some inland place. And you could talk about the sand, and you could show pictures and tell about the sound of the waves and what it feels like, but there's nothing like experiencing it. I didn't have the experience. I just knew about Jesus, but... I didn't have the experience and so I didn't hear his voice like I do now because I had never stepped into that relationship with him so I went to college and I was a French major and an English minor and with those two um, subjects you there's a lot of literature that you're studying I love to study I love to be in the library all the time and what they basically did I hate to say it but they tried to teach you not to believe in God all of the authors, the existentialists, and all these people, all these philosophers in their literature, they were constantly telling you, this is mythology that you're believing. One myth is like another. And so it didn't happen right away. But after a year or so, some doubt started to creep in. And I wondered about this, and I wondered about that, and I didn't know. I wasn't really an atheist, but I felt I was agnostic. But I was open to learn more. I just didn't know where to get the answer. No Bible, no way to know. So after college, I got married and 
situations of abuse perpetuate themselves. You know, you don't even realize it, but you've come from this background and you're apparently attracting that same type person. And, and it wasn't long that I was in a very bad situation. Again, not to indict anybody, but this is, you know, the way things were. I remember my first baby being born. He was only two weeks old. I was holding the baby. My husband came in very late. He was drunk. And he slammed me in the mouth for apparently no reason at all, chipped a tooth. I went flying to the ground. Thank God the baby was okay. This was life. This is what, I mean, what are you going to do about that? Go back home to your parents? You can't do that. I was not happy. Things were not good. There were more situations of coming about. At the time I got pregnant with my second child, I found out some, you know, there, there was things going on that were not good. Um, there was a lot, you know, womanizing, all this kind of thing, and the reports were coming to me. At that point, I felt, I really don't want to be pregnant. I don't want to be in this marriage, and I don't really want this baby. And the other thing was, I was born on my mother's birthday, and they were telling me my due date was that same date. And I was thinking, this baby's going to be a girl, and it's going to be the same thing all over again. She's going to hate me. I'm going to hate her, and it's not going to be good. So I went to the doctor, and he said, the child is not developing in your womb. You should be, you know, much bigger. You're just, he said, there's something not right. I don't think you're going to be able to keep this baby. I don't think it's working. And I went home that day, and I thought, you know, it's me. It's because I don't want the baby. And I made a decision that day. I want this baby. And I don't care. I'm making a different decision. And so I went out to, to an ice cream parlor and ate ice cream. I thought, well, I've got to gain weight or something. I, mean, I went to another store and I bought maternity clothes because I wanted the baby. And you know what? I have to tell you this story. I never had a problem with my daughter. She's such a sweetheart. The minute I looked at her when she was born, that sweet little face, I loved her, she loved me. We get along like this. That cycle of abuse never started with, it didn't happen. And she has a little daughter that looks just like her and acts just like her. And it's my pride and joy, my little granddaughter. So things don't have to be that way. You can choose to go a different way. But the divorce did happen. And, and I didn't know at the time the stress he was under because the business that he was in was failing. I thought we were prospering like crazy. He, it was a, a court case. The, they said it was abandonment. He had left. And, okay, what do you do? You, you know, you talk to the lawyer. The lawyer says, hey, I have some really bad news. He's in debt up to here. And, and not only that, but the house that you're in, he signed your name off and, and you, for the debts. And you owe all this money, and now the house is under litigation. I said, what? I said, no, well, they didn't say he signed. They said, I signed. I had not signed it. I, I realized he must have signed it because I didn't sign it. But anyway, uh, as it turns out, um, the bank that was owed all this money hired all these handwriting experts. They said, it's definitely her signature. It wasn't my signature. And I couldn't move out of the house because the house is under litigation. But I had to pay the bills or you'd be out in the street. I have an infant baby and a two-year-old. My sister came with her husband and she said, we'll move in and we'll pay you rent. That'll help pay some of the bills. And she said, you can work for us because we need somebody that would make, they were, they were working in art craft shows and they had these certain crafts. You make the crafts, we'll sell them at the art craft shows. We'll make it, together we can do this. And so that's what happened. In the meantime, there was no food in the house. <laughs> there was no anything in the house. It was terrible. At one point, my mother said, oh, take these cake mixes, you know, home with you. And when I, and I opened my kitchen cabinet, and there was no food. There was only five cake mixes. And we made a joke about it, you know. <laughs> what did Marie Antoinette say? Oh, let them eat cake, you know. Only we didn't have the eggs and milk to make the cake. And we certainly didn't have things like cleaning products or... I mean, I was just using like vinegar and, and a rag, you know, I mean, we were really on a marginal budget in, at that time, living in a beautiful house and, and just barely making ends meet. So my sister and her husband, they would travel around to these art craft shows and they would have to go from, you know, this motel, that motel, and they would take everything that they could out of the motel. 
the tissues, the toilet paper, the little soaps, the shampoo. Yeah, so, you know, we used it. That's what we did. And so my sister came back one day and she says, guess what I got this time? I said, what? You know, and she said, I even took the Bible. She said, I said, really, a Bible? She goes, yeah, there was a Bible in the drawer. In the, in the... I said, wow, I always wanted to read a Bible, but I, I never could find one, you know. And she says, well, here, take it. So I was excited I was going to read the Bible. So I opened the Bible. It's the most amazing thing. It was like I just opened the Bible, and I started to read where Jesus was in front of Pilate. And, and he says, are you, are you the son of God? And Jesus says, yes, I am. And there was something I just knew was true. I knew it was true. And I said, that's it. I closed the Bible. I said, that's it. I believe it. But I didn't know about born again and all that. I didn't know how you do the sinner's prayer. I didn't know anything. But that was on a Friday, so I'm thinking about it over the weekend. I'm thinking, what do I do? What do I do? And I decided, well, I have to dedicate my life to, to him. Whatever he says, I'll do it. But I said, you know, I don't know what church to go to. I used to be Catholic. What am I supposed to do? And how do I get there? And what do I do? So Sunday morning, that, like I said, that happened on Friday. On Sunday morning, I woke up. I was so excited to read this Bible. So I thought, well, I'll start in Genesis. So I started to read a couple chapters in Genesis. And I got to one verse, and I thought, I don't know what this means. I got frustrated. Closed the Bible. I don't know what this means. It was 6 o'clock in the morning. And the phone rang. Who, rang, who calls that early? And it was a lady across the street, and she said, I hope you don't mind I'm calling, but would you like to go to church with us today? I said, yes. <laughs> but I was nervous because they go to a Protestant church, and, you know. See, as Catholics, we were trained, you, you don't trust Protestant, you know. It was, they never said about Jews that it could care less about. It's like, don't never, don't have them for friends, don't marry one, you know. It was, and I, I thought that was like the worst thing you could be as a Protestant, you know. So now I'm going to this church. So we get to the church, and it doesn't look right. There's no stained glass windows. The walls are white. The priest is not wearing any kind of outfit, you know. <laughs> I'm thinking, what am I doing in this place? There's no place, like, to kneel down, you know. Nobody's kneeling down, getting up. None of that stuff's happening. And I'm nervous, like, what am I doing here? And then when he gets to do the sermon, the pastor opens the same verse that I saw at 6 o'clock in the morning. And he says, today I'm going to talk about this. And I, that was my sign that God was saying, hey, you're in the right place. It's okay. So that was like a wonderful month for me because I was so excited. I would read the Bible as much as I could read it, you know, read it, read it. Go to church. I would, anytime the church was open, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I was there, I was there. I was so excited about everything. And then something happened. My mother, I told my mother about it. And my mother said to me, you know, most of my life I felt like killing myself. Very strange. I didn't know she had that issue. And she says, do you think it's really possible that there is a God and that there's, you know, that there's help? See, my parents never went to, went, never went to church on Sunday. I did. And every Monday morning, the nuns would say, anyone whose parents did not go to church on Sunday, stand up right now. And of course, I had to stand up. I was so humiliated. And they would say, your parents are going to hell, where they will burn forever. Now, I want you to go home. And three times tonight, you must tell your parents that they're on their way to hell. Of course, I thought you had to do that, you know. So I'd be so scared I'd have to say this, you know. At dinner, I'd be trying to say, I mean, everything. And at night, I'd be lying in bed, seeing these visions of hell and thinking, ah, oh, my parents are going to hell. You know, that was my life. Anyway, here's my mother. She says, I, I, I have felt like killing myself. Is it possible there's something? She said, my friend says there's a church. Will you go with me on Sunday? Well, she was living about 45 minutes away from me. I said, okay. So it was a different church than, you know, the church I was in. I was in that other church and happy for a month. So we went to the second church, and something's really different in this church. First of all, I felt this presence of God. I didn't know what it was, but, you know. And then all the people were so worshiping. They were like this. Their hands were up. There's ecstasy was on their face. They were singing in the spirit. And I'm thinking, this is different than the other place. What could be going on here? And so then the pastor got up to speak and he says, 
anyone who would like to be baptized in the Holy Spirit come into the basement, uh, you know, when church is over. So I had never heard that before. I didn't know what that was. But I said to my mother, I want to go. When church is over, I want to go downstairs. And she said, okay. So we went downstairs, and maybe there were like 12 people down there at that time. And so this young black man, maybe in his 20s, you know, he, he put a hand on me, and he said, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? I said, yes. Do you believe he died for your sins? I said, yes. Do you believe he rose from the dead? I said, yes. And then he just said, receive the Holy Spirit. When he said that, it was like 15 lightning bolts hit me. <laughs> I'm shaking violently. And I don't know what's happening. And something's like coming up, coming up. Of course, now I know what it was. I was, you know, speaking in tongues. But I was afraid and I didn't want to let it come up, you know. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. But this incredible, incredible love was coming down on me. And I couldn't speak for three days. I couldn't speak in English. People would say, what's happening? What's happening? I can't talk. I'm just out there. In the meantime, I was engaged to be married to husband number two, but he wasn't in the area. He was living in Pennsylvania. I was in New Jersey. I forgot to tell about what happened with the house. When we actually went to court, the, the first husband gets up on the witness stand and says, I forged her name. He says, now what are you going to do about it? <laughs> I didn't know he was going to say that that day. So all that litigation, everything was over, and there was actually equity in the house, which we, we took and we could, you know, later buy a house in Pennsylvania is what happened. God came through even then. But anyway, back to the story. So here I am, left behind in, in New Jersey while he's off, you know, in Pennsylvania, and I'm in having this honeymoon with the Holy Ghost. So for five months, while I'm back in New Jersey, by the way, that church was in Wyckoff, New Jersey. Um, I'm like in ecstasy because every Sunday, it is so amazing what's going on. You couldn't even get to the door. You're shaking under the power of God. You're crying. You know, people were being healed. People were being, oh. And, and it was always different. The pastor didn't just do the same old thing. Like he would stop and say, the Holy Spirit is saying today people need to be healed. And he would point out different ones. They were prophesying. It was really a move of God that was going on. And that year was 1977. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said to me, I want you to pray every day for your country. He said, because the day is coming when you will not be able to worship freely in the country. And he said, and I want you to memorize as much of the Bible as you can because the day is coming. They're going to take your Bible away. Well, I'm new in the Lord. I don't know that, you know, if that's possible. I'm thinking, I, I must have heard wrong because that can't happen in the United States of America. So I'm thinking, well, it's not that God's not telling the truth. It's that I, I'm not hearing right. So this is 1977, but I'm thinking, that can't happen in the United States of America can't happen and he said this is the prayer I want you to pray every day he said father for the sake of your son Jesus would you have mercy on the United States of America very simple prayer that was it and here we are now and you say to yourself you know is is that possible Lord do we appreciate the fact that we can worship freely and we're not under persecution do we thank God every day for that How much Bible did we spend time learning? Did we take it for granted? We'll always be able to have one with us? No. And I remember Sister Joan, we had her last month at Rapa House. She said, a time is coming when there'll be a famine of the word. Famine of the word. I used to wonder, what does that mean, famine of the word? You mean we won't have a Bible? So anyway, going back to the story. So we went to the... Uh, pastor and said, you know, we, we want to get married and we, we're engaged. And he, he said, well, I can't marry you. You're not equally yoked. Again, you know, not understanding what that meant. And we just found somebody else who would do it, you know, stupid, because a lot of the problems that came were because there were two different kingdoms, two different kingdoms. So I came to Pennsylvania 
We moved to Chester County, beautiful farmhouse and many acres, just gorgeous place. And I was lonely. I didn't have anybody. In those days, you couldn't just pick up a cell phone and call somebody because it cost money, you know. And I missed everybody. And, you know, I was hearing God really well. Even back when I was in New Jersey, he would tell me to do stuff, and I would just do it. One day he said to me, get in your car. I want you to travel uh, to see your friend. And she was 45 minutes away, he said, and bring your Bible and tell about me. Well, she hated anything to do with God. If you hadn't had a cross on, she'd throw you out of the house. I said, well, I'll call. He says, no, you don't call. You just get in a car and go. And so I did. So I showed up in the yard. She was hanging clothes out in the backyard. And she said, why are you here? She was happy to see me. I said, I'm here about this. And she said, oh, no. Oh, no. Absolutely not. Then she looked at me for a minute, and she said, I'll give you 20 minutes. That's it. After that, you're done. So we went into the kitchen, sat down at the table. And the thing is, I didn't even know what he said because I didn't know anything. I mean, I'm just newly saved. I don't know anything. I have no clue what I said that day. She said to me, will you leave that Bible here with me for a week? I said, sure. I left. Well, she got saved. <laughs> she started going to church with me. <laughs> because when the Holy Spirit tells you to do something, it always works. So now I'm in Pennsylvania. I'm in this beautiful place lonely. The Lord says to me, I want you to witness for me today. I said, you've got to be kidding. I haven't, the phone doesn't even ring. I never heard, I haven't seen or heard from anybody in four months. While I'm saying this, the phone is ringing. <laughs> I'm thinking, what? I can't believe this. So I ran into the house to get the phone and I'm thinking, this is it. I'm supposed to witness. I wonder who it is. I pick up the phone. It's my sister. And she says, Hey, I'm in town. We're doing our crap shows uh, in, uh, in Exton and we're in PA and you know, I'm um, going to visit you tonight. Then she says, what's new? I thought, oh, i got to tell her now. <laughs> you know, I said, oh, well, but what's new is that um, I'm, I got saved. She goes, you got what? I, I got saved. She goes, what are you talking about? I said a couple of things. She says, I don't understand what you're talking She says, tonight when I come, you tell me what you're talking about. So I'm like, I, you know, hung up the phone. I said, Lord. I don't, I don't really want to go into this. If you want me to say something later, have her bring it up. So they come to the house. They spend the time. You know, now it's like 11 o'clock at night. They're ready to leave. She's ready to walk out the door. She says to me, oh, by the way, um, what was that thing you were saying on the phone about getting saved or something like that? So I tell her. Again, I don't know what I said. Just tell her. Tell her. So she didn't say anything. They got very quiet, the two of them, and they left. And about 20 minutes later, my phone rings. Now it's midnight, you know. And uh, I pick up the phone, it's her, and her voice is like this. Bonnie! I said, what? You almost got killed. I said, what happened? She said, you won't believe it. She said, we were almost in an accident, and, and this trailer, this truck almost hit us, and da-da-da-da. And she says, I heard the devil laughing. I said, you heard what? She goes, the devil was laughing. She says, you better tell me how to get saved right now. She says, tell me how to get saved right now. I said, well, I'll, I'll tell you when I see you. She goes, no, not when you see me. You tell me right now, <laughs> he said. So my sister got led to the Lord right there on the phone, and her husband too. And again, if the Holy Spirit tells you to do something, you just do it, right? Okay. <laughs> so now I'm, I'm in Pennsylvania. Everything's going pretty good, except second husband, well, he... He gets some money from a lawsuit. He gets $50,000, and suddenly he becomes obsessed with this idea that he has to buy a bar. And I said, absolutely not, and so it began, you know, fighting about that. And he got violent. I mean, he was, like, taking me and throwing me against the wall and slapping me. I mean, that had never happened before. I'm like, whoa, two months of this is going on. Meantime, I had started to go to a church in Pennsylvania, on Sunday, he wouldn't go with me, but it wasn't like the old church. I had tried so many churches. I went to this one, this one, this one, and it's not the same, you know. It just wasn't that presence of God. It was, but what are you gonna do? You gotta go somewhere, you know. So anyway, and I even tried to make friends every day. I would pray, Lord, would you just give me one Christian friend? Nothing. I went to the women's group of the church. They were all snobby to me. They wouldn't talk to me. 
I was lonely. I was here alone in Pennsylvania. I mean, I think maybe God was using that as a time for me to get to know him better. I'm not sure. But anyway, I said, oh, Lord, if you would just let me find a woman's aglow or one Christian friend. Every day I prayed it, nothing, nothing, nothing. No discipling, didn't know anything. I'm in a church where I'm not feeling, you know, much going on. So one day, the pastor of the church comes to visit the house, and he observes that the front door has a big hole in it. And the reason was because (laughs) the husband had punched the door, and he was very mad at me because I wouldn't buy the bar. So the pastor says, is there something going on here? I said, yes. He said, what's going on here? And I told him, I said, oh, two months, you know, he wants me to buy this bar, and I want to buy the bar. He said he'll divorce me if I don't sign up, you know, buy the bar. So the pastor says to me, you have to buy the bar. <sighs> Such bad advice. But you see, at that time, I didn't know, you know. I thought I had to do what he said. He said, you have to do whatever your husband says. That's what you have to do. If he wants to buy a bar, you buy a bar. Okay. So I sign on the dotted line. We buy the bar. In the meantime, he's never home. Because he would come home from work and go immediately to the bar. The bar didn't close till 2 in the morning, and then he had to do all the, you know, you have to count the drawer, do all that stuff. He'd come in around 4 in the morning. My life was, like, totally devoid of anybody. I didn't have him. I didn't have friends. I didn't know what to do. I joined, like, the woman, the junior women's club. I joined the ladies auxiliary of the fire company. I'm trying to meet people, you know. And I'm lonely. I'm here in Pennsylvania. I can't talk to anybody. I never see him. One year goes by. I never walk the, into the bar, and he's madder and madder and madder at me all the time. He's exhausted, and he says, it's not right that I'm doing all the work, and you're doing nothing. Well, I was home with a, a new baby. You know? But, you know, he, in his mind, I was doing nothing. So he says, you have got to come to the bar. You've got to work there. You've got to order the beer. You've got to do this, do this, do this, do this. You can just take it so long, you know. And then I I felt like, I've got to do it. What am I going to do? You know, this is my life. And so I got sucked into this lifestyle that I wanted nothing to do with. And again, like I say, no discipleship and all that. More abuse continues, more stuff, not even going to all that. The point is, I got to a point where I was so angry at the stuff I had to live with and the stuff I had to take and the way my life was going. I I made a decision that was very bad. And I'm telling this story because people need to know about being backslidden. I walked away from the Lord. I said, I've done everything you said and nothing's worked. I turned the other cheek for the millionth time and I'm taking this abuse and I'm living a nightmare. I said, now I'm going to do it in my way. That was a very bad thing to do, but that's what I did. And I tell this story because there's people out there who did the same thing, and they need to know you can come back. Anyway, that strong presence of God in my life, that hearing God, ended. And I was off on my own little world. What did I do? He wouldn't give me money. My kids had nothing. I couldn't feed them. I couldn't get them clothes. The baby needed um, pampers and desitin and all that. There was no money. Finally, I got to a point I took the money and threw it up in the air, and I said that he gave me for food, which was a joke. I said, you figure out how to feed this family. I can't do it. Anyway, so I decided I'll just steal from him. So I'd go to the bar. I had to count the money. I would just take money out of the register. I knew it was wrong. I was, you know, lying to him, really. But I didn't care. I was at, I was like, I had it. And I figured I've got to do something. Well, step by step by step, you get eroded and things, you know, go down and down and down. And the investment that he made in that bar was going down. I didn't know it. Once again, he was under tremendous stress financially. I didn't know it. So he gets a job transfer and moves to Ohio. And while he's in Ohio, I'm back tending the bar and waiting for the house to sell for a long time. Till one day he came back and he said, I want a divorce. I met somebody out there. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, well, um, what are we going to do about, you know, the kids and and finances? And he said, let your lawyer talk to my lawyer. And he left. And so I told my next-door neighbor, 
she told her mother. The mother calls me up and says, honey, you better get a lawyer. She said, I said, I don't want a divorce. She says, no, you better get a lawyer and get one now. You're in trouble. So I called the lawyer. I said to the lawyer, look, I don't want a divorce. She says, you have got no choice. You have to file for divorce because if you don't, all the proceedings are going to be in Ohio, and you'll have to get on a plane and fly there. You've got no money to do that, no ability to do that. At least we'll have it in our own court. We'll have things happen here in Pennsylvania. I said, well, the house is now sold. It's going to go to closing, um, and it was a swing loan. So the money was going to a house that he had bought in Ohio. So she says, we'll find a loophole, and we'll get out of it. And so it began 10 years of litigation, 10 years litigation because that's exactly what happened she stopped the closing and he was furious he wrote me a letter and he says I will litigate you until you're in the street and you're dead he said I will I will make sure that you don't have one dime left <laughs> so the vendetta starts and the trouble starts if you go to Chester County Courthouse right now and you look at my file I'm not kidding it's like the high the last the last judge said you can't be serious, this can't be. Yeah, I was in court every month for 10 years because after that was custody cases. And, and you see, I didn't have God on my side because I already walked away, you know? And that made all the difference is when you don't have God with you, everything is going down, down, down. So somebody at the bar said, actually it was the bartender. Dick likes this bar, Dick used to go to the bar. The bartender. <laughs> who had slit his wife's throat and had gone to jail and was a Satanist and everything else. So he said, uh, you, Dick said, I think it would be good if we go to church. Because I knew him, you know, he was there every night. And I was there every night in the bar. And so Dick says, well, maybe we should go to church. Maybe there's an answer there. And so the bartender goes, yeah, and if you go to church, I know a good church. He said, uh, after I got out of jail, those people took me in. They helped me. And uh, he said, well, you need to go to this, this, you know, Mennonite church, you know. So we thought, yeah, we'll go there, you know. So we go to the church. And, you know, the, the pastor came to the house to visit. And he says, hi, oh, you know, how are you? I think Dick offered him a beer. So we were just out there. We were, like, in a different world. And uh, he says, how long have you been married? And Dick says, we're not married. And he's like. Okay. He says, um, well, uh, what do you do for a living? So Dick says, well, she's running a bar. Well, that was like the, the poor guy, you know. He, was like, <laughs> he says, when you come to church next week, I have somebody I want you to meet, you know. Okay. He says, will you stay and talk to him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, he used to run the Elverson Hotel, used to be a barkeeper, but now he's a pastor. Oh, okay. We'll go there. This is be your pastor? <laughs> And we're doing anything wrong. Meantime, we come to church. He's straight has so many beer cans in the car. They're falling out in the parking lot. He's smoking a cigarette. This is where we were at. You know, not discipled, walked away from the Lord, don't understand anything. That's where we were at. People who are born again, they need to be discipled. Okay, so anyway, we meet with this guy. He says, Why aren't you married to him? I said, I can't because we're not divorced yet. I said, it's been 10 years. It's still litigation going on and on and on and on. By the way, that, that court case went to the federal level, the highest court in the land before it was over. <laughs> anyway, so he says, well, then just sign a paper. What does he want? I said, well, there's $100,000 in equity in the house at least. He goes, well, give it to him. Just get out of this mess. And, and I said to Dick, as we left, I said, that guy must be crazy. I said, he wants me to walk away from, you know, $100,000, you know. Is he crazy? I said, why do they have us meet with these nuts, you know? <laughs> That's where we were at. So, anyway, we didn't get it, but God was waiting. He couldn't touch me until I was married. We couldn't get married till the, so it was very shortly after that, divorce came through, we get married. The next time I walked into church, something was different. After all those years, the Holy Spirit's presence is all over me. I was shaking violently. I'm crying. And I'm thinking, what happened? I was coming here before, but God couldn't touch me because I was living with him and I wasn't married to him. That's for somebody. 
you know, you're, you're like, God's holy. See, I hadn't even repented because I didn't get it. But one day we were in worship and all of a sudden, like the silence comes on me. I don't know what's happening. It's like everybody's praising. Everybody's, you know, whatever. And I'm just like really quiet. And um, I'm, I'm like, I'm standing there. I'm thinking something's about to happen, but I don't know what it is. I'm just standing there real quiet. And then I hear the Lord say to me, you never said you were sorry for leaving your husband. He says to me, I'm like, what? After everything that he did? Da, da, da. And then I realized, God's serious. <laughs> I have to repent. And of course I did. And then it started. Now, everything seemed like it was better, but it really wasn't because what happened was Dick was an alcoholic, 25 years lost his job <laughs> so in 1992 when he quit drinking all the stuff he had suppressed all his life came to the surface well I didn't know that's how these things work but that's apparently it he was such a nice guy you know but when he stopped dr uh, smoking it started to you know a little bit he was losing that nice edge you know getting a little irritable and you know but when he stopped drinking like it was like all hell broke loose. And he was like crazy. I'm like, who is this guy? Now I'm in abuse number three, you know? Because he's having like rages and fits and destroying the vacuum and throwing the crock pot upside down in the kitchen floor and all that stuff. And I'm desperate. I don't know what to do. He's angry. He's not angry at me. He grew up in abuse too. He had been suppressing it. Drinking since he was 14 apparently. And uh, as long as he could take that drug, you can hold it back. You can hold back that tide of anger, resentment. But when you take the drug away, which in this case was the alcohol, it just, there you go. And so he was, you know, doing the AA thing and going to all that stuff. And I don't know what to do. I'm going to the church people and I'm, help me, help me. I don't know what to do. My husband's gone crazy. And, that, and so <laughs> this one lady in the church, she says to me, don't call me anymore. And she says, as a matter of fact, don't call anybody because nobody here can help you. She says, only God can help you. And if I were you, I would take the phone off the hook for three days and seek the Lord. Well, first I was a little annoyed, but then you know, I thought, well, you know what? I'll do it. So I went into my bedroom. I took the phone off the hook for three days. Now I thank her because I'll tell you what, that was the best thing she could ever said to me. So many people are dependent on other people. Get me through, help me, help me. They need to go to God. I took the phone off for three days and I'm crying out to God and I said my life is a destruction it's a ruined I don't know what to do marriage number one didn't work out marriage number two didn't work out marriage number three is not working out my children are suffering I don't know what to do I said my situation is hopeless I said why don't you just kill me I said or if you have a use for me I'll work for you he said okay immediate immediate like like that okay I said, what do you want me to do? He says, I want you to quit your job and go to the school of ministry. I said, quit my job and depend on, you know, him for money. <laughs> he says, he says, this is serious. He said, you're in a battle. And he said, there's a war raging. And he said, the very lives of your children are at stake if you don't obey me in this. Whoa, a war. I'm thinking, a war? What's going on? He says, do it. I said, okay. So I enrolled in the school of ministry. And praise God, I graduated at Chesapeake Bible College much later, you know, went through the whole thing. And that was 1994. In the meantime, I said to the Lord, oh, all these prophetic words kept coming. Everywhere we went, we would go to church and somebody, some guy you didn't know, some pastor, some whatever, preacher, he would say, you too. The Lord says, your marriage will work out and you have a ministry. I wasn't a true dick like every month, everywhere we went. Dick said, for the first guy, some pastor from Georgia, he said, that guy must be crazy. He said, he calls himself a prophet. <laughs> and so, and it was going on and on and on everywhere we went. You two, your marriage will work out. And the Lord says you have a ministry. Okay, so um, finally I got to the point I said to God, that's nice that you're telling them. Why don't you tell me? I need to hear you myself. 
So I said, I'm going to worship for a while. And, and so I worshiped for like an hour. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit started to speak to me. So I took out a piece of paper. I wrote down what he said. And this is what he said. He said, erase your thoughts of Dick and replace them with mine. <laughs> he said, Dick is my son. He has my nature. He's like me. He's loving, giving, forgiving. He's a good shepherd and a mighty warrior. He will do great things to advance my kingdom. And I said, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. And that's, he's telling me this, you know. And he says to me, I, he said, how long did it take you to have children? I said, each one was like four hours. I was, you know, blessed that way. It was really four hours. He said, you've gone three and a half hours. And from that, I figured out, because I counted it from the day that he stopped drinking and went crazy. I figured out, well, then, then there's six months left. I was all excited. I had a word of God. So I came back to the church, told everybody. They said, I don't think so. Nobody hears God like that. God doesn't set dates. It doesn't happen. One lady says, by the way, she says, your husband will be in counseling at least 20 years. <laughs> he says, that can't be right. Six months? She goes, no, he's out there, you know. But exactly six months later, Dick woke up and he said, I don't know what it is, but I, I feel like a thousand pounds got lifted off me and I can't remember why I'm mad at you anymore. <laughs> Meantime, we're in school of ministry, you know, Debbie was with me and others and we were in the school of ministry and um, Pastor John, uh, he was an Episcopal pastor that was in in a church down in Elverson. He said, part of the requirement of this course is you must attend my church on a Wednesday night and fill out a report. So we did. We went to the, his church, uh, not knowing what was going to happen. You know, walk in. Meantime, we didn't know, but Pastor John had been up to Toronto. There was a move of God going on. He was carrying the importation. And he had brought this back into his church. So we walk into the church, and I'm standing there. I'm thinking, what's going on in this place? Because... Everybody's shaking, everybody's full. I mean, people are just dropping like flies, you know? And um, all this stuff is happening in this. But I said to myself, I recognize this. That's that same presence of God that was back in the church in New Jersey. Only it's looking different, but I know that, I know that presence of God, it's him. I know it's God. Then I had a vision. I saw like, like I was in this jail and, and the door of the jail opened up and I saw myself walking out and some lady in the back yells out, and the, the prison door is opening and you're going free, you're going free. And then all of a sudden something's like bubbling up, bubbling up. I thought, oh, I'm probably going to get a prophetic word or something, but it wasn't that at all. I started laughing like an idiot and I fell down. <laughs> and we got launched into a whole new thing. Neil was there too. Well, we didn't know what it was, but it was wonderful. It was just wonderful. Well, it came with persecution, you know. Pastor John came over to me and Debbie, and he put one hand on you, one hand on me, and he says, Lord, make them drunk for two weeks. Well, that sounds cute and everything, except it literally happened. Have you ever spent two weeks where you could not stop laughing day or night? You can't even sleep. You're laughing. You don't know why you're laughing. You're just laughing. You know, you're up all night laughing like an idiot in bed. You have no clue what's going on. Meantime, I'm still in the school ministry, so I had to be there in the morning, you know. I walk in the door laughing, laughing like an idiot. And uh, the pastor says, what's happening with you? I don't even know what to say. So the pastor's wife says, come in my office right away. So I come in and she says, look in my eyes. What drug are you taking? I said, I'm not taking a drug. She says, why are you laughing like that? I said, I don't know. I mean, honestly, I had no clue. I don't know why I'm laughing like an idiot. So we had signed up to be at the women's uh, ministry for the weekend. And it was during the time we were laughing like idiots, you know. And, and it was a woman's retreat in the Poconos. And so the only problem was we were all so drunk in the spirit, we couldn't get there. Because anybody I even got near, if I just touched them, they would get it. You know, they were laughing and it was crazy. So five of us were in the car. We're trying to find our way to the Poconos. We're lost. We're going around in circles. We're stopping at diners, trying to look at maps. We can't figure it out. We're falling down on the ground in the diner. By the time we showed up at the, the woman's retreat, we were completely four sheets to the wind, making a spectacle. We didn't mean to, but it was just like we were out there. We scandalized the place. These are nice Mennonite ladies. They had the, you know, the head covering, all that stuff. And here's a bunch of idiots like laughing like, 
And, and some people were saying, come lay hands on me, so I'll get it. Come lay hands on me. They had rejected me from being in the, in the cabin with the pastor's wives because I was laughing too much. And they said, you take one of those outlying cabins. I said, okay, you know. Well, first what they said to me was, now this is the schedule. You have to be here at 6 in the morning. At 6.10, you will show up there. At 7, you'll do this. And 8 o'clock, we're doing this. And at 9, we're, and it went right on until like midnight. I said, what happened? Did we join the convent? When I said that, everybody started laughing. Of course, that was the wrong thing to say. Okay, they said, you're out of here. You're, you're going to go to some outlying cabin. So we went to the outlying cabin. Meantime, everybody, we touched. They're laughing. We're dancing around. We're, we didn't even sleep that night. Now it's four in the morning. We're laughing. There's a bat that was flying around. I thought that was hysterical. And we had to be up at six, but I never slept. And so they're saying, oh, time to wake up. Oh, you know, laughing, time to wake up. Okay. And we had to find different buildings and stuff, and we couldn't find them. We're staggering around in the woods. Well, this didn't go over real well. So on Monday morning, we were called in on the carpet. We had to give an explanation why we disrupted everything. But the funny thing was, right, Debbie? <laughs> Everybody we touched was getting healed. People that couldn't walk. People were getting delivered of demons. All this stuff was happening. It was wonderful. And, you know, when you've been, and then the one lady, <laughs> good friend, you know, of ours, you know, the two children uh, died in a fire. She was in such severe depression. I mean, this person couldn't even smile. People are laughing that never even smiled in years, you know. God was doing healing and restoration. And, and my daughter said to me, I came in one night, she's 14, and she says, Mom, I don't know what you're doing lately, but whatever it is, keep on doing it, Jesus. <laughs> And I remember he was mad at me and saying something, and, and you, you know, and, and I'm just laughing, and he couldn't, you know, how do you have a fight with somebody who's laughing? What are you going to do, right? <sighs> oh, yeah, that's right. So uh, so the one lady, the night lady, you know, she, she says, um, lay hands on me. I want to get that laughter. I want to get that. So we lay hands. She doesn't get it. Okay, she didn't get it. Well, that night at 4 o'clock in the morning, she was in the room with the pastor's wife. She got it. And she fell out of bed laughing like an idiot, and she couldn't, couldn't get a hold of herself. <laughs> That's the house we were at, Kathy. <laughs> the last house we were at, Grace. That was her. Yeah. So anyway, it was a scandal. We got called in on the carpet. So on the day that we got called in on the carpet, and you guys got called in separately, and then I got called in, and we got, you know. And the Lord said, don't worry about it. He said, whatever they ask you, I'll tell you what to say. He said, this is he's going to be easy. He says, first you'll stand and give explanation before leaders of the church, but eventually you'll be leaders in the government. He said, I'll always tell you what to say. It's an amazing thing because everything they ask me, I seem to have an answer and seem to work, you know. Why are you laughing? I mean, it was amazing. So anyway, we were supposed to leave immediately after that and go pray for this young man that basically he was brain dead. He was in a car accident. He was 17. And they were going to pull the plug. And so the Holy Spirit had spoken to me and said, I want you to go pray for him. Well, okay. In the meantime, I didn't, you, know, you didn't know that I heard that, but Debbie said, she heard the Lord say that. Okay. So she went and asked permission of the pastor, and the pastor's wife said, absolutely not. You can't have those lunatics, you know, going in the hospital and praying for anybody. <laughs> but the pastor said, what harm can it do? They're going to pull the plug. Let them go. So even after we had just got yelled at and whatever, reprimanded, we went that day to the hospital. And when we got there, it was Debbie, me, and Grace. Grace was there. And when we, <laughs> when we went, walked into the room, this kid looks dead. I mean, he's totally white. That machine that has the line, like it's a flat line, you know. And the Lord said to me, don't look at that. Don't look at that. He says, look with spiritual eyes. So I look with spiritual eyes. I see Jesus standing there. He's in the room. So we go to lay hand. You actually, I think, laid hands on him. I didn't even. I just had my hand like over him about two feet, and it felt like lightning bolts are coming out of my hand. This kid starts jumping all over the bed. He's gone crazy, you know. He's up. So the nurse comes in, and she says, what are you doing in here? You have no permission. Well, too late. He came back. And then I saw Jesus standing there, and he said, he's going to the school of ministry in the fall, because this was in the summer. Well, he did. And he's alive and well. 
Yeah, praise God. And that's not to make us look good. This is just telling you that things can look crazy. Things can look outlandish. But the Holy Spirit does things that are different. The next move of God will be different still. I don't know what's going to happen. But if you're open to the Holy Spirit, how did, and then people would say later, Bonnie and Dick, come to our church and I'll explain how your marriage got better. You know, what? You studied the word. You did this. You did that. You prayed every day. No, we didn't do any of that. What did you do? We went to where the Holy Spirit was pouring out. And we just submitted. We were there two, three, four nights a week. Any church that had something going on, you know, we would come. And, and, and they, in those days, they'd lay hands on you, you know, and say, you know, what do you want? More, Lord, more, Lord. And we would just, you know, fall down under the anointing and the power of God. And he rearranges your life. I can't fix my life. And I can't fix anybody else's life. But when you come into the manifest presence of God, and you don't run away from it, but you come and submit to that, he changes everything. He gave me a dream at that time. I saw, like it was that St. Mary's Church where we would go every Wednesday, and I saw it moving in like it was on wheels. And it was coming towards my house. It was night. And I saw lightning hit the steeple, and the whole church is falling down on my house. And when it did, my house like broke into a million pieces, and I just stood there real calm bricks and glass were flying and there was water flooding in i woke up and i said to the lord what was that he says i'm taking your household by force because if you give him permission he'll take over you know they used to say well he's a gentleman and all that you know is my time up maybe huh? oh, okay <laughs> so my message you know year, years later the lord said to me I was, you know, feeling sorry for myself one day because, you know, oh, with the divorce, the kids have to spend the holidays with this one, that one, I'm lonely, da 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 da. And the Lord said to me, Now you know how I felt when you walked out on me. I'm like, What? He said, You broke my heart. I started crying so much. I was driving the car, I couldn't even see. I'm crying so much, I can't even see. I don't even know how I got home. I had a half hour ride yet to get home. And then another day, I heard this music like blast off in my head. And it was that song from the old days, you know, My Little Runaway. I'm like, what is this? And the Lord says, you are my little runaway. I said, I will never leave again. I will never leave again. I'll tell you that right now. I don't care what happens. I will never leave again. But you know what? I was backslid. We went to uh, North Carolina to a prophetic conference, and they had uh, three prophets in the room. And each person would come in, and they'd prophesy over you. They never saw you before. So I come in the room, and this friend of mine's in the room to write down what God said. And uh, they're hearing this song, My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, Bring Back My Bonnie to Me. Two of them heard the same thing. And then the one guy says, he says, You were away from the Lord a long time, weren't you? I said, Yeah. And he says, Well, the Lord says, Your wilderness time is over. I'm putting you under a waterfall, and I'm going to wash you, and I'm going to turn everything around for you, you know. And he says, you're the apple of my eye. He's telling me all this stuff. I'm crying. And then he said, this is very interesting. Very interesting thing to say. A man never saw me before in his life. He says, your past husbands, he said in the plural, neither your past husbands nor your present husband can keep me, can keep you from what I have for you. In other words, guess what? <laughs> it has nothing to do with the people in, in your life. What, when God has a destiny and a plan for you, Okay, remember I said I prayed every day for a Christian friend. I prayed to find a woman's glow, never had it. He turns around and makes me president of women's glow and gives me zillions of Christian friends. But that was later. Why didn't it happen back when I prayed? You know what? I don't know. When I get to heaven, I'll ask. He did answer the prayer. He just waited for a timing. So sometimes when things aren't happening, maybe it's just not the time. But I became first vice president and then president of a glow and after that in the year 2001 we can every speaker that would come to that a glow would say this ministry is about to change it'll have the same word and they would go into what it's going to be and what it's going to do and, all, and we had it all on tapes you know the one man of god says it's going to be called rafa house and he explains what that is and all that and so one day we heard the lord together many of us we were praying and it was the board of Rafa House. And he said, start immediately. Leave a glow and become the thing I told you to be. So I came home and I said to Dick, 
we have to become, you know, we're leaving a glow. He said, you can't do that. I said, we not only can do it, we're going to do it. He said, do it. I said, the only thing, Dick, I don't know what, I don't know what we're going to call the new ministry. He says, oh, yeah, you do. Remember the man of God said it'll be called Rafa House. I said, oh, yeah, that's right. So in 2001, we became Rafa House. And the point of the whole story is God has a plan for us. He has a purpose for us. We've been in ministry 15 years. There's a lot more probably I could tell that would be good, you know, concerning what happened after that. But we might have a time up. Is there a time up? Yeah. I, yeah. And, and so um, God is no respecter of persons. What he does for us, he'll do for you. I said to the Lord, why would you pick somebody like us? You know, with the background we came from. And the Lord said to me, because I want them to know that no matter how bad their marriage is, no matter how hopeless things look, no matter how, you know, many entanglements and crazy things they've been through, it's not hopeless. In fact, if you're listening to this message tonight, it is definitely not hopeless. Because God wants to reach out. He wants to take the, the backslider. He wants to take the person who's never had the experience to hear God, hear what he's saying, and he wants to bring you close. He wants to give you the same thing he gave us and is still giving us, because there's more. There's a lot more I could tell. All the time I hear him, he's telling us stuff. We only do what we hear the Holy Spirit say. Every time the Holy Spirit says, do something and we do it, it works. We don't come up with ideas on our own. We wait and listen and do what he says. So I, I just want to leave with that. Yeah. Yeah, we talked about the difference between knowing about something, knowing about someone, but then knowing them. When you know them, you know their voice. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and no other voice will they follow. If I get a telephone call and it's my husband, he, I don't have to look at caller ID. I know his voice. You know, we're close. And that's how it became. Well, what was the difference? His Catholic school, I knew all about him, but I didn't know him. Because when I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior and live inside of me, everything changed. And all the doors opened to walk with him and be in him and him in me. And I hear his voice, and it's the most wonderful thing. I will never give that up again. The presence of God is too precious to me. Take anything. I don't care, but you're not taking the Holy Ghost from me. Some people try to trick me and say, you need to give up the presence of God so you can find out what it's like to, you know, have the dark night of the soul. I said, forget it. I'm not interested. <laughs> I want to keep the presence of God in my life. It's too important to me. You know, if you want that other experience, go for it. But I don't want that. Like David said, take not your Holy Spirit from me. People say, well, what does presence mean? Did you ever know someone's in the room and you didn't see them? You were sleeping and you feel someone staring at you and you open your eyes as one of your kids? <laughs> you can feel their presence. <laughs> you know, they don't even have to talk. You feel their presence. And the presence of God is love itself. He loves you. He accepts you. And all you have to do is ask. You know, you took my sins, and now I'll live for you. It was a divine exchange, you know. You took all my problems and guilt and shame and blame, and you took it on you and died for it. Now, my life isn't mine anymore. I'll live for you. What do you want me to do? Come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And you can do that right now. And if you're backslidden and you said to the Lord, you know, I tried all this stuff, it didn't work, or whatever thing you said, you know, you got mad at God because somebody died and that you believed, you know, they would be healed, or whatever that happened that disappointed you and hurt you. If you're even listening right now, I know it's not too late for you to come back. For it to be too late for you to come back, you wouldn't even care what I'm saying. You wouldn't even listen. You wouldn't even be listening this long. But if you're out there and you are listening, and you are backslidden, he's calling you right now. It's like the prodigal son out in the pig pen somewhere, and he's putting on a rope. He's putting a ring on your finger, and he's celebrating because you said, yes, I'm back. I'm back, and I'm not leaving anymore because I can't live without the presence of God in my life. 
So that's the invitation that I'm putting out there right now. God bless you. And walk in the fullness of everything he has for you. It's wonderful. Thank you.